I'm your host, Christine, and this week I have with me an ER nurse named Beth. Welcome, Beth. Hi. So this is exciting because for once I am not recording with someone that is across the globe or across the country. You are just across the couch from me. You're actually local. Yes, I am. Just down the road. So you work in an ER in the D.C. area. Yeah, it's been my first job straight out of nursing school, and I've loved it. So a lot of times people are like, oh, you can never work in the ER right out of nursing school. Obviously not true, because you did it. Right. Um, And I understand both perspectives. You are, you know, straight out of nursing school in an environment where life or death, etc, etc. But it really depends on which hospital you work at. I happen to be in a system where they have a really good mentorship, preceptorship, orientation program, etc. Where you learn a lot, you take a lot of classes, and my orientation was long. It was like three, four months, and it was great. But, you know, if you're just thrown in immediately, I think that would definitely be, you know, unsafe. I knew I never wanted to work on the floor. Never. I either wanted ER or psych, and I get psych in the ER, so I just went in for ER. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of psych. In, I know there's a lot of psych in the ER. Yeah. Some hospitals that very much have, like, an eat your young mentality about mm. them, and eat your young culture. And if you have that, then you can't do a challenging job like that. But exactly, because you're supposed to be looking to, you know, the older people for experience. You want to be able to ask for help, ask your advice, stuff like that, so... It's, it's going to be hard if people are, you know, bullying you straight out of, oh, well, you're too young, you're too experienced. Well, how am I going to get experience if you don't help me, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's our job to foster the next generation of healthcare professionals. And the same thing goes for providers and nurse practitioners, every level of professional. You know, if I went and got bullied every single time I asked one of the doctors I work with a question because I had no idea what I was doing, I, I would quit. I would just cry. I mean, I want to cry sometimes anyways, <laughs> but... Like, you're, every day you're learning. That's why we're in this field is because we love to learn, so you have to kind of support that. Another thing is EMTs start out in emergency medicine their first day. Totally different scope of practice. You're dealing with generally one patient at a time, but they're brand new to the field. They start out in emergency medicine, so why can't nurses do it with more training? Everyone has a day one somewhere, you know what I mean? Everyone's... Yeah. Sometimes you're going to walk into the room and it's going to be your first time doing something and that's going to happen every single day. But that happens even more with emergency medicine and that's kind of why I wanted to go into it, you know. Yeah. I'm coming up on my two years in, in the field and again, I'm learning things every single time I go to work and I love it. And they say start in med surge, like med surge is easy. Yeah, I think that's almost insulting to the med surge nurses. It's, that, it's yeah. extremely insulting. Mm -hmm. Med surge is hard as shit. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I don't want to do it because it's exhausting mm -hmm. and it's it's just it's very difficult. You have to juggle a million things in the air and people yell at you all day long. No, thank you. I can deal with people yelling at me. I can deal with wiping butts, but I don't want the same people yelling at me or the same butts wiped. You know, I want <laughs> different ones coming in I, every couple of hours. I like variety in my butts. Thank you very much. Exactly. That's what I've <laughs> always thought, you know. Of course, then we get the same people that just love to hang out with us in the emergency room and you get quite familiar with those, but you deal. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens too. We knew people in EMS. Oh, yeah. We would, for anyone that watches like the show Shameless, Frank, do you watch Shameless? I don't, but my mom just has gotten into it, so I feel like I need to. It's so good. And you look at Frank, who is the dad of the family, for anyone that has seen it, and you're like, yeah, you know those ERs know him. And, like, if you worked at EMS, you're like, yeah, you have a Frank. He's kind of, he's an alcoholic. He's always up to no good. And you're like, okay, yep, what's up? You, you know his name, his date of birth already but as you roll up on scene or something. We have our little walkie-talkie that, or radio or whatever, that goes off when an ambulance or medic's coming in. You know, they don't give out personal information other than just age, chief complaint, and stuff like, and sex. But sometimes just describing what's going on with them, even being super vague, we're like, ugh. You know, who's coming in, prepare this room, that's their favorite, you know, stuff yeah. like that. It's like, oh, someone at this time of the night who's coming in for constipation, oh, that's Mr. XYZ. That was CMED is what we used to call it in Boston, the radio you would call into. Yeah. And so when I would give my patches to the ERs, you can't give out identifying patient information, yeah. but certain things I know, the e like we had codes for certain people oh, kind yeah. of. You know, you'd be like, 42-year-old gentleman, well known to your facility, yes. coming in tonight for... <laughs> I hate hearing that phrase, <laughs> well known to your facility. Well known to your facility. 
known to you earlier this afternoon. He still has your bracelet on. You're like, oh, God. <laughs> yes. We did have this one individual who I haven't seen him in I'd well over a year, luckily. And he again, he would come in in the middle of the night for enemas. And <laughs> it had been documented repeatedly by the doctor that, you know, given instructions on how to perform enemas at home, given instructions to patient and, you know, partner on how to give enemas at home. And even in one of the notes, it said, provided Amazon link to patient with how to purchase IV pole to provide soap suds enema at home. Like, I think he just enjoyed the whole hospital situation. Who knows what this individual enjoyed. And at one point, we would have to do imaging to ensure that this patient was actually required an enema. And during one of his visits, he did not based on, you know, the x-ray. And so we discharged him and left behind a big old stool sample and a bedpan with the doctor's business card just stuck right in the middle of it as he left. The patient did that? Yes. Yeah. So we go in to clean the room and that's just what we see in, in the middle of the room is just the doctor's business card stuck in a poo in a bedpan. Creativity. I know. Right you know now. what? This was a baking show, like mm. I was watching earlier. A plus on presentation. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor was so excited to, like, the rest of the day be like, guess what I, guess what a patient did for me. I'm like, oh, you're so tickled by that, aren't you? <laughs> I would be. I know, me too. Like, that guy went out of his way mm-hmm. to present that to you. Personalized uh, insults. My personalized <laughs> insults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's flattery. It's very flattering. So, I mean, there's a million stories about working in the emergency room. Oh, yeah. I'm sure everyone's asked you the same thing that they used to ask me. What's the craziest shit you've seen? Well, it always depends on what perspective you want to do it. Like, if someone, you know, like you or another healthcare professional is asking me what's the craziest shit I've seen, I can, you know, delve into a medical story about, you know, something really medical cool that's happened. Right. And then if my mom's asking me, you know, what's the craziest thing I've seen, it could be like, you know, something that's just kind of funny, but they're going to understand yeah. it just from yeah, yeah, an yeah. outside person's point of view. Yeah. So it's kind of all over the place, but... Since we are on a healthcare podcast, I think one of the coolest things I have seen was a woman comes in via medic and presents with just multiple complaints. It was like epigastric pain, abdominal pain, back pain that radiates down one of her legs, and she's just screaming all over the place. And we're just, we're, I'm looking at her paperwork and the report from the medic. It says that this person had been to their doctor yesterday and been given actually P.O. Dilaudid. Just they believed it was gastroenteritis. But now everything's gotten worse and gone everywhere. That's and a lot, lot of medication. I agree. To be given by, but anyway. I so. agree. I was shocked at that. And now everything's happening and everything's awful. And we're like, well, that's... We had no idea what was going on. And yeah. then every... Every once in a while, she started going into um, having these PVCs, and then it was by Gemini. So PVCs are these... Oh, sorry. So, (laughs) yeah, no, this is great. I like to do a little break of, like, this is what this is. So PVCs are these premature ventricular contractions. Basically, the bottom of your heart, the ventricles, are all of a sudden like, whoa, I'm going to do my own thing. And they contract, like, out of sync with the rest of the heart. Your heart has its own pacemakers. And it makes everything work together. But sometimes parts of the heart are like, no, 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 I'm going to do what I want. And so PVCs, they'll just happen. And they can happen like if you're dehydrated, if you're tired, if you've had way too much caffeine, whatever. But if you start to have a bunch of them, or they're two or more together, so by Gemini, then it's like, oh, that's not good. This one was every other beat was PVC. It was, so it was like normal heartbeat and then that, and they were non-perfusing. So sometimes preventricular contractions, they're okay enough that you'll still feel, you know, a radial pulse. There'll be enough to get some of the blood through. But these weren't because her, you know, radial pulse was dropping to half of what it was. Yeah. And we're like, what in the world is going on? Found out that she's retaining all of the CO2 as well by doing a blood gas send her off to um, CT, and it turns out that her, like, half of her stomach and one of her bowel loops had herniated up through her diaphragm and was occupying most of, like, the space where her right lung should be, so that couldn't fully inflate. Because it's all herniated up, of course, it's her stomach and gastric contents can't empty, so any pain meds she was taking by mouth were just still sitting 
in her gut and all this fluid. But her gut was actually like in where her lungs should be. Exactly. So just making all of the pain worse. Yeah. When we put in an NG tube and then, you know. A nasogastric tube. Exactly. So, so tube up the nose into the stomach to relieve some of that pressure because that's what was causing all that most of the pain was just she had almost a liter of fluid because it had been for a couple days just built up, compressing everything. And her back pain and her leg pain went away. We think it was compressing on one of her nerves back there. And that's mm, probably on... like her sciatic nerve or something. Exactly. So yeah. we ended up having to transfer her to another hospital just because our surgeon was like, I don't feel comfortable touching her. Yeah, that's crazy. But that's, I'd say that's the craziest thing I've seen, medically speaking, for sure. So a, a liter of fluid. So mm -hmm. think of a big soda bottle. That's two liters. Mm -hmm. Half of a soda bottle of fluid is just like in her, was actually in her stomach. Yeah, that was what came out of the nasogastric tube. Right. So that was in, in the, stomach. the stomach. The stomach is usually like, they say it's like kind of the size of your fist, maybe a little bit bigger. So instead of being your fist, it's half of a bottle of Coke. And instead of where it's normally supposed to be, it's most of it's been shoved up through that muscle wall and is sitting right where one of your lungs is supposed to be. Yeah, no no wonder you yeah. needed Dilaudid, but it didn't work. <laughs> so we did put her on BiPAP, which is a kind of like mechanical breathing. It's not the tube down the throat like you picture. It's a face mask that's forcing air in due to that compression of the lungs. She needed some assistance. Yeah, her. yeah. So did they do any procedures in your hospital or did they just get her out? After the nasogastric tube, no. Just that. Yeah, she didn't get admitted at all. She went ER to ER. So she went to one of our sister hospitals that had a, a more well-equipped. How long had that been going on for? She had been feeling bad for like four or five days. And what my we had just theorized, which is pure speculation because, you know, we have no idea, is that she probably did just have some sort of gastroenteritis, something not that bad and probably a pre-existing substantial hiatal hernia. So that's when a little bit of the stomach comes up through the diaphragm, and that can happen when you have history of gastro reflux. It happens naturally with age, things like right. that. Sometimes it has to be surgically corrected, sometimes not, but we're predicting she probably had one of those going anyway and just had been vomiting, and the perfect storm happened where she just everything yeah. up. Did it twist at all, the stomach and the intestines? Because that's a volvulus. Yes, the stomach hadn't twisted. No, it just had come up. And then I'm not sure if the if the bowel loop had twisted or if it just kind of got slurped up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor lady. I know. Well, at least she got it fixed. Exactly. Well, I don't think anyone who's, like, not really in the medical field or, like, really is interested in the medical field would get that story. Exactly. So then I have to, like, draw pictures, and then even with the pictures, they're like, oh, that's cool, I guess. I'm like, no, but seriously, that's, ah, you know. This so. doesn't look like the operation, man. I don't really understand. Exactly. <laughs> We're so you kind of really have to gauge. Know your audience. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I always told, like, the snake story at parties, because mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh my god, I can understand a snake being thrown at me, but some of the more crazy medical cases, mm -hmm. like, there was this one that we did, it was actually a drug overdose, but it was um, a polysubstance drug overdose, where this guy, it was, so we went to this hotel in this very, very low-income urban area. Mm -hmm. It had great hourly rates. And you think I'm being, like, mean, but no, they did. Like, no, they are that, being descriptive. That's, like, actually how they they advertised. Mm -hmm. And it's in this back alleyway, right? So it's, like, out of a movie mm -hmm. that it's so grimy. Have you seen the movie Seven? Yes. So it looks like one of the, it, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. Like, it should be, like, one of those apartment buildings or something. Yeah. And it's February, it's New England, so it's cold. Everything is this horrible snow brown, gray, dirty color. So you just want to basically stay inside where it's warm. Gotcha. You want to stay inside where it's warm, but also everything just is like really depressing. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. So we're in, at this really terrible hotel. There's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of not so greatness. Depressing before the um, overdose is even happening. Is what you're yeah, saying. yeah, yeah. Depressing before you decided that you needed to have an hour in this place. So we go, and the cops had called for a guy that was just sleeping. They were like, "Oh, he's just drunk." Like the, you know, the ambulance needs to come and get him. And so we're like, "Okay, whatever." So we go and we get him, and then we walk in there, and my partner and I look at him, and he's steaming. And we go, "Why is he steaming?" Oh no, that's not right. And the cops kind of like try and move him around a little bit, like, "Hey, buddy, wake up," you know. And he doesn't wake up. And he has all these um, pills with him, like some boxone pills. You mean like literally steam is coming off of his steam body? Steam is coming off of his body okay. inside. 
inside. We're inside the hallway of, and it, there's not enough lighting. It's very dingy. And so he's all these pills around him, and we're like, what the hell is going on? So I'm like, he's not sleeping. So I do with like a sternal rub on him, yeah. which is, for anyone that doesn't know, you take your knuckles and you rub really hard on their sternum. Everyone that's listening to the podcast that is not in the medical field, go do that right now. <laughs> You'll learn. No, don't do that. <laughs> It'll hurt. Okay. Um, that's how we make sure that someone is unconscious or not. You know, it's a painful uh, response to stimuli. If you don't wake up to that, you are unconscious. You're not going to fake it. Well, some people can. But anyways, more power to them. So, dude doesn't wake up. I'm like, okay, he's unresponsive. Look at his pupils. You know, you hear hoof peats in Texas. You think horses, not zebras. Probably an overdose, right? Mm-hmm. But he's steaming. This is not typical of opioid overdoses, or body overheating. So pupils are also a pinpoint, which is stereotypical of an opioid overdose. So we get him into a stair chair. A stair chair is it's a metal chair, so you can carry people downstairs. It's got like handles and stuff on it. We had to pick him up, put him in this limp body in a chair so we can get him down the stairs. So, I'm picturing like how emperors are put through a city, you know. With the, kind of, yeah. yeah, kind of, but like less um, ribbons. Okay. <laughs> I see we need to make a movement for more ribbons, but continue. <laughs> well, well, it, this is going to get a little bit uh, festive. So we get him outside, and he, I mean, he's breathing. He's hes breathing okay. His color, it's, it's very flushed. He's very, we touch him, and he's just hot, extremely hot. So ambulances don't carry thermometers. They just, they don't. And the ones that do, they even say, like, like during report, well, we got a temp of this, but our thermometer sucks, so do a repeat. Like, we hear that so often in report in the ER. We were not allowed to have them. They're like, it's not in your protocols to have a thermometer. Don't use it. I don't know why. I don't At least in our area, we have them because or it's within protocol to treat febrile children for our medics. Maybe it's like with an ALS, advanced life support skill, to take a temperature. I don't know why. <laughs> we were not allowed to have thermometers. I, I don't know. I also know that in our area, we have really advanced protocols. We have a really great medical director. Yeah, I met him. Um, He's a cool dude. Oh, he really is. That medical director is like the shit. Yes, he is. <laughs> So anyways, we didn't have some rumors, but you could just tell. Hot. Also, the fact that he's steaming. Still concerning. Still, yeah. They were like, okay, this, there's a lot of things we're not sure about. So we hear BLS, we call for ALS, and we're like, mm, what the shit, okay? So we get him outside into February in New England, and steam just kicks up a knot. There's just so much steam coming off of this guy because he's so hot. And we were like, what the fuck is wrong with him, right? So we get him in the ambulance. We take all of his clothes off because whenever you don't know what's wrong with someone, you just strip them. Oh, yeah. You get him trauma naked. We, he wasn't a trauma, but that's the best way to figure out what is wrong with someone is just to expose everything. Because there could be something sneaky hiding somewhere. Yeah, we don't know if he got stabbed. We don't know if he's got a rash. We don't know if he's got track marks. We have no idea that maybe he's got a fentanyl patch attached to him and that's causing him to overdose. Like, got medical alert bracelets that you can't find. You just get him naked. Obviously, in the ambulance, you do this. Not in the middle of the busy street in the middle of the city. In the ambulance, get him naked, and there's track marks. He's got the pinpoint pupils. He's unresponsive. Breathing's pretty slow. So we're like, okay, looks kind of like an opioid overdose. We see a lot of these every single day at the time. This was kind of before the opioid epidemic was actually even on anybody's primetime news. But the medics are there, and the medics that I was working with, they get him on the monitor, and I'm trying to remember how this went, because this got weird real fast. (laughs) Weirder. It's got weirder. And... (laughs) So they had to get a line on this guy, but... Kind of why I enjoy assisting with the treatment of ODs, because they do get weird fast. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't a cut and dry one. Oh, you know what it was? So they had to get a line on him, and they kept trying to get all these lines, but he had abscesses on his peripheral... Like, so usually you the elbows, the ACs, the antecubital fossa, and all the other sites had abscesses. There was a lot of scarring. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult to get lines there. And for some reason, the vasculature was kind of, it was just really bad. So the the line that the medics got on him was an EJ. It was an external jugular vein. Don't know why they didn't get an IO on him. Don't remember. We had IOs on the truck. They just decided to get an EJ. So they get an IV in the guy's neck. But he's so sweaty, the tape isn't sticking to him. Mm -hmm. So we have these films, these sticky films, and you just put them on top of the IV dressings. They 
called Tegaderm. The Tegaderm does not stick. He's so sweaty. No. And then we used, we were using like roller gauze and then kind of taped it around it a little bit. But then you have this extension set that goes up off the line. And so then it's just kind of like hanging there, kind of the only access they could get. So he's on the monitor and then he, he stops breathing, right? So great. We start to bag him. We start to breathe for him. And I'm bagging him and he's on the monitor and they're trying to get, I think they're trying to get an IO or get another line because this one's not really stable or something else is going on. We're also trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Was and it I, within protocol for you to administer Narcan, which is the so, opioid reversal agent? Yeah. So I'm banging him. The medics are trying to get the Narcan to give it IV because it works better IV than it does gotcha. nasally. We could do nasal Narcan. Our service was actually pretty early on mm -hmm. with having waivers for BLS providers to be giving Narcan because the op opioid use was so bad where we were. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of it. Yeah, so they were doing that. And this this happens like very, very, very fast. This is like a matter of seconds. Kind of all this stuff happened. And they gave him the Narcan. So he had been in a nice sinus rhythm. So that was normal. We were talking about PVCs earlier. Yeah. None for this dude, right? Nice, normal heartbeat. A little bit fast, like 90s, right? 90s, 100, which is weird for kind of a heroin overdose. But if that were steaming, I'd be, you know, my heart would be a little quick too, I think. Right. So mm -hmm. we're like, this... It just doesn't kind of seem like a normal one, but you stop breathing. Let's treat what we've got, right? So, so we they give him the Narcan, and they all of a sudden he starts to vomit profusely. And this was a, yep. as they were about to tube him. Then we're like trying to suction him, and we're trying to bag him, and then he starts seizing. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and we're like, oh my god! So he's vomiting, seizing, and not then, breathing. Not breathing. But then he then he starts to kind of breathe. <laughs> then the seizing stops and I was like guys I think this is also like a cocaine overdose some kind of stimulant too because like maybe he was like um, speedballing mm -hmm. and maybe the heroin was keeping the coke down and so now that we reversed the heroin now we're in a full-blown cocaine overdose yeah and we were so he stopped see the seizure stopped he kind of stopped vomiting we're trying to clear the airway they're tubing him and um, I'm looking at the monitor and I'm like oh guys guys heart rate you know 110 130 140. Oh, no. No, 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 no. 160. Stop. <laughs> Stop. VTAC. Oh. V so ventricular type of cardio. It's a, it's one of those rhythms. It's way too fast. It's not a, it's a ventricularly driven rhythm. The heart's going way too fast. You're not going to perfuse. You're not going to have a pulse for very long if you have one at all at the beginning of this. So the sinus tack went to a VTAC and we're like, oh no, this is going to go into VFib and then his heart's going to stop. So... The medics light him up. They shock him. Shocking and drugs. He had, the guy ends up getting shocked like eleven times. Oh my gosh! How um, long is this? Are you driving the whole time, or is this all just still in the parking lot of the hotel to stabilize? So started seizing, shocked him once or twice, started drugs, and then let's get the hell out of here. Gotcha. Shocked him probably another seven or eight more times in maybe 15, 20 minutes on the way to the hospital. Not very long. It was really quick. And then we get to the hospital, and this is big Boston hospital. If you ever go to these big hospitals, you give your note over the radio to the ER. And um, so I ended up giving the note as the one that was driving. Usually it's the people in the back, but they were busy. Just a they, bit. They were a little bit. They had their hands full. So I gave the note, and it's really intimidating, especially as an EMT, to walk into these giant teaching hospitals with these trauma teams and like there's all these residents and these attendings and all these nurses and like every medical professional in this ER that is Ivy League affiliated hospital is staring at you going give us a report and you're like okay you gotta go I'm covered in vomit like let's let's rattle up all these facts and you gotta do it and so we gave a report and then they just worked this guy up and I think they ended up taking his temperature and it was like 104 or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he survived. I don't know what his neurological outcome would have been after that. See, that's a big part of emergency medicine is we a lot of the time don't know the outcome. You know, right. You just gotta be like, bye. Oh yeah. my god. The poor guy. I mean, it was crazy just to be like, okay, now, now we do this, now we do that. I mean, uh, and again, I'm not making fun of this poor man. Obviously, addiction is a horrible thing and don't, don't do drugs. But it's just... As a provider, you're like, you think it's so cut and dry. You think, okay, this is just a heroin overdose, or this is just an opioid overdose. We're just going to give him Narcan. Nope, you never know what the drugs are going to do in your body. You have no idea. I mean, maybe he didn't even know that there was cocaine or stimulants in there. Right. But I Probably did, but, you know. I think it's fairly obvious that you're not making fun of him either. He wouldn't have put himself in that situation without, you know, having that addiction, that disease process going on anyway. You know, who wants to be 
steaming in a motel hallway. No one, you know. No, 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 no. And it's just, you got to be on your toes exactly. when you're dealing with this. And Everything you were describing to me, it's like, well, I know what I would do if I were in the ER, but doing it out just in a medic unit, that blows my mind. You know, that's it's just such a cool part when, you know, my medics come to me and give me a report. I'm like, wow, you did that in that small amount of space and so quick. That's pretty awesome. And the hardest part about like doing, not the hardest part, but one of the things that you realize like when you're doing all of this stuff is you're doing that with a winter coat on, oh right? My God. So you have this winter coat on and then you're like, well, now we're working at cardiac arrest and I'm, someone's trying to vomit on me and it's like really hot in here and this guy's really sweaty, mm-hmm. but I've got this coat on, but I also have gloves on so I can't like take my coat off. Do I go in cold or do I go in hot? And, <laughs> and then you walk into the ER and you're like dripping in sweat. Your, like, clothes are untucked because you're like, I'm trying to, like, pull this coat off. I don't know how to get out of my clothes. Because you end up sweaty and exhausted doing CPR when you're just in scrubs inside a climate-controlled code room. You know, I can only imagine, you know, all cloaked up in the back of an ambulance. Goodness. Yeah, and then if, for some reason, the patient has to be really warm. Like, if if they're hypothermic or something, and then you're sweating, and then the ambulance ACs never worked. Mm. Never, never worked. And so when you know, I was walking to the ER, my hair is like matted to my face. I look like a drowned rat and I'm like, I turn bright red when I exercise. <laughs> I'm so pale and I look like a tomato and they're like, what is, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm just really hot. Can I please have some water? <laughs> and there's this meme I love that's just on all the nursing Instagrams and stuff. And it's like, my fitness goal is to not look like I need to be coded after I run a code. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one cardiac arrest we worked was not funny, but was 98 degrees that day. And of course, cardiac arrest happened on like the third floor of this walk up. And mm. there's like a narrow staircase and you have to bring the person out. And there was very inappropriately hysterical family members. And of course, you expect family members to be hysterical, but like they were, oh my God, like they're, they're dead. What am I going to do? They were like, oh, we're so sorry. Like you know, when was the last time you saw them? They were like, five minutes ago. And you're like, wait, you already gave up? We can, we might be able to fix this. Like, <laughs> they were like, I'm going to have to get my will out. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> we might, we might be able to do something here. Like, we were ready to pronounce them. And then <laughs> the family member was just like, nope, nope, they're gone. That's it. <laughs> so, so then we carry them out. And then... That's a sketch. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a little sketch. And then you're like... Okay, well, weird. Yeah, I mean, everyone responds to grief differently, of course. Absolutely. But we, like, the way that they were saying it was like they had been down for hours and hours, and and nope, that wasn't the case. They were just very accepting of fate, I guess, uh, very pragmatic. So we're working the cardiac arrest, and super, super hot out. There's no air conditioning in this place. And this wailing family member who was talking about having to find the will and, like, planning the funeral as we're still working this person. And we're like, this is so weird. It's just a very weird response that you don't usually get. And we knock into their desktop computer that was in the hallway. Because, of course, when you're moving someone out of their house, like, you hit everything. Everything's too small. So we knock into the computer, and the screensaver had been on. Mm-hmm. So it turns off the screensaver. And the <laughs> oh, no. the desktop background for their computer was an older gentleman's genitalia. Oh, so we're working the cardiac arrest and we're just like, oh, oh my, (laughs) it's me and a bunch of firefighters and we're just like, what? (laughs) Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. Um, cause you don't, it's one of those super awkward things where you're like, you don't want to laugh, but of course you're with a bunch of firefighters who are like, obviously you want to laugh because why did I just see that? Yeah. Why? I mean, no judgment. Cool. You you do you. Like, this is your I house. Bet, but, huh. I bet there was a digital copy of the will, too. So to get to the will, they're going to have to look at that. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I No, like, they were lovers. Yeah, but no. still, what I'm saying is, you're thinking about the death, and I need to go pull up the will, and you just have that staring at your face when you're having to think about the death, is what I'm saying is. Yeah, I don't know. I think that I... Whatever I think floats your some, boat. I think there was something kinky going on there, which is like, sure... Yeah, whatever. but there was just so many things that were just, like, incongruous right with, like, the situation. Oh, yeah. It's like that old joke, like, you know, whenever I die, please go delete my browser history. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay. Go change my desktop background. Go change my desktop background. So we bring him out, we work him in, we're just, like, dripping sweat, and we're like, what just happened? 
and we get to the ER and they take care of him and they pronounce him. He didn't make it. But, and then the <laughs> when the nurse comes up and goes, there's an ice cream social downstairs for the staff if you guys want some. And we're like, dude, this was awesome. This was like fantastic. <laughs> yes. Like, we got free ice cream. This was weird, but we got free ice cream. I'm here for it. You have these weird reactions to things that are like very tragic, but... <laughs> So then, of course, you're just sitting there eating ice cream, thinking about this old man's genitalia that you saw on this computer screen. You're like, well, so this was Wednesday. This was fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> Reminds me very similarly to when I first started out. I had an individual who had a DNR order in place. So if anything were to happen with us, we were to do comfort care only as far as if they looked like they were going to pass. And that's fine. That's just as declared by the patient and the wife, and I had to catheterize this man to get some urine sample out. And as I was catheterizing him, that is when his heart stopped. Oh, no. Oh, yes. So I just see up on the monitor, his heart rate was, you know, in resting 90s, and then now all of a sudden it goes to the 30s. And I'm just like, luckily, catheting a person is a two-person procedure. I'm just like, can you please feel for a pulse? And they did not feel anything, and I just... I guess you could just feel for the femoral. That's pulse. what they did, luckily, That's because we were all right there, so we just scrapped that. I pulled a family member aside and quickly had to switch modes. But now when I tell the story, everyone immediately wants to laugh because it's a story about me and genitals and death. But it's like, you have to switch gears so fast sometimes in medicine. So you're right. going from the death of this person, you're working the code, and then you're looking up and you see this on the screen, and then you're there, and then there's an ice cream social. You really have to... Your mind's all over the place a thousand times a minute when you're dealing with this kind of stuff because that's how life is. Yeah, and that's how death is. Mm -hmm. That's how life is. That's how death <laughs> is. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, no one, nobody dies in like a perfect... Actually, my first dead guy mm -hmm. was a perfect death. Absolutely. Just uh, out of the movies. So we... Okay, so the first time I pronounced somebody dead. So when, if you die at home and someone doesn't know that you're dead, they call 911. So fire department EMS shows up. And the EMTs and paramedics go and they pronounce you dead. And then the, well, the cops, they have control of the body. And then the coroner shows up and you get released to the funeral home or whatever you want to do. So it was a while before I had someone that was actually, like, found dead at home for some reason. I had a lot of people, like, that died with us. Mm -hmm. Not because I was a terrible EMT. Just because. Coincidentally. Just in, in, no. <laughs> just how the cards were drawn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, like, uh, cardiac arrests and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, they died after we transferred care. But they were, like, found dead people. So the first time I did it, I had a partner who was newer than me because I had been a senior. I had been working for a few years. And we get the call for a sudden, sudden death. My partner's like, oh, I've never done one of these before. So obviously she's afraid. And so you feel like you work it up in your mind, too, a little bit. You're like, all right, we're going to go see a dead body right now. And we have to go touch it. So it's more your mind than any. And the fire department is on scene first, and they're like, yep, dead guy's in the basement. Sun's in the basement. So, great. First time I'm pronouncing someone's dead, and it's in a basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So, I walk into this house. There's this very, very Italian Boston lady sitting with an apron on and some stockings around her ankles at this table with the vinyl-covered chairs. It's very, very Italian Boston. And I go down, and then there's this basement in this really old house. My partner's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, nope, got to be, gotta be brave. Okay. Yep. But put on a stony face, and let's go into this dead guy basement. Fake it till you make it. Fake, fake it till you make it. Absolutely. So uh, there's no lights for part of the basement. We don't know. The fire department doesn't tell you where in the basement the dead guy is. <laughs> they just say he's in the basement. Go find him. Now I'm picturing, like, a John Benet Ramsey-style basement where there's all these doors and hallways. <laughs> Or, like, Silence of the Lambs, and there's, like, a pit or something. Oh. <laughs> no. So, I walk down to this basement. It's a... It's not totally finished, but then it's partially finished. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm like, okay. So, I have, like, a flashlight, and then I, like, I find a light. I'm like, why didn't anyone turn these lights on before? Like, maybe the fire department's messing with me. I don't know. They could do this. And so, then, there's, like, a room. And so, then I go in, and I open the room, and it's a nicely finished room. It's nice and cool, which, if you find someone at home dead you want it to be cool oh yeah this guy this older gentleman he was laying flat on his back with the sheets there he was perfectly tucked into bed like you would see out of like in a children's book the sheets and blanket were folded with like the sheet was you know the sheet was like just folded over on top again yeah, yeah. it was perfectly straight 
and he was wearing like this dark green sweatshirt. He had this perfectly trimmed mustache and he was laying with his arms folded across his chest. This looks fake. This is not how people, like people don't die this peacefully in their sleep. And his eyes were closed. Like, are you, are you kidding me? Like I thought it was like someone like faking being dead mm -hmm. that was going to jump up and like scare me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is not scary at all. And so then we went and, you know, you check the pulse and the heart rate, you know, listen to the heart for a minute and nope, he's dead and great. And you, that was it. And you walked away and I was like, oh, that was so weird. Yeah. It never happened like that again. Yeah, ever, ever, not. ever, ever. Usually it does not happen like that. It was so normal that it was weird. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people pass, not necessarily only my patients and also, you know, other patients of other nurses while I'm just in the department and don't necessarily get used to, I guess you do kind of get used to death. And as long as you handle it with, I guess, respect and also you try not to take it home as much, it's okay to get a little comfortable with it, I guess, to talk about and discuss. And I know we had um, recently someone pass and we always let the family in afterwards to say goodbye and whatever they need to do. And we come back in a little bit and they're all in there sitting around and eating Chipotle and chatting and telling stories about the family member while that person is there in the middle, deceased. Huh. Yes. And all of us were like freaked out by this, but you're like, you got to let people do what they want to do. And then about 20 minutes later, when they finished telling stories, finished eating their meal, they packed up, they left and... It was, it was all good. So it's like they had to do what they had to do and it was the end. You know, death is always very unique to every individual and to every family member. It's part of the reason why I, a lot of people hate doing the whole post-mortem care that's once a person dies, getting them ready for the morgue. I, I would say enjoy it, but participating in it is something that I really do like to teach to others who don't know how to do it and stuff. It's just, it's my last little act of respect and goodbye before that person's gone. Like, we couldn't help you, we couldn't save you, but at least I can make sure that you're together looking neat for the next time you're brought out, you know? Yeah, and I, I don't enjoy, obviously, death. Yeah. But I do take a lot of pride in giving someone a proper death. Yeah. There's a way to do death correctly. I think that's what I'm trying to say, just yeah. struggling to grab the words. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy thing to talk about. And mm. there are people that, there are professionals that don't do it correctly. Mm. And for the family members, it's, it's, it's horrible. I mean, that's the memory that they have with them. You know, I'm, I made a lot of jokes about my experiences working with cardiac arrest in this episode, but like when it comes to talking to the family members, you know, I, I, t I have a lot of pride in the way that I do it. I know people that have just been like, they're dead. Sorry for your loss, and they walk out. No, you need to you need to kind of deliver that news and maybe answer some of their questions. You know, sometimes I would say, "Do you have any questions for me?" The best line that you can ever present to anyone in healthcare. Just, do you have any more questions? Yeah, and I remember one time we pronounced someone. They had been upstairs, and it was like their granddaughter or something. And she said she was obviously so distraught, and she was going, "He's dead because of me. He's dead because of me." And I said, "Why do you say that?" And she goes, "Because, you know, I know he was really sick and." He died in his sleep and I was supposed to wake him up. And if I had only just woken him up from his nap, he would be alive. He just, he died in his sleep. She didn't see him. She, like someone else had found him and then told her. And I said, he didn't die in his sleep. He was on the floor. He got up at some point. Mm -hmm. So if you had woken him up, you know, he woke up. He didn't die in his sleep. You didn't do anything wrong here. And she was obviously still very distraught, but the amount of relief that she had because it wasn't her responsibility, his death was not on her hands. I mean, obviously it would not have been on her hands anyways. It was his time and everything like that, but she had some belief that it was not. She was finally convinced that it wasn't her fault. She felt better. And if you had just said, sorry for your loss, he's dead and walked out. She would have carried that. She would have believed that wholeheartedly. And there's no one else in the world that prob that could have told her that convincingly except for me, right. having been the person that pronounced him dead. You have to, you know, you have a big responsibility. You have to do it well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Beth. <laughs> we... Uh, we'll have to do this again. Sounds some great. More stories. ER nurses always have stories, so. Yeah, being nice and local, I'm sure we'll be able to meet up again, and I'm sure my little bank of stories will refresh for you guys, <laughs> so yeah. Well, if anyone else out there has stories of their own that they would like to share with the podcast, please get in touch with me. You can do that through our email, which is antidotespodcast at gmail.com. And please, please, please give us a review and a rating on iTunes. It really helps boost our appearance in the searches and get us on charts and everything. So it would really mean a lot to me. Doesn't really matter what you say. 
if you say something nice, that would really be, that would be wonderful too. And <laughs> you can also get in touch on Facebook and Instagram. Both of those are Antidotes Podcast. And then Twitter is Antidotes Pod. And my Twitter is Christine the NP. And that is it. Thank you guys for listening. And I will see you next week. Next week is going to be awesome. Goodbye. Bye. I waved. There's no one here. I waved until my